speaker is Cheng Zhang. Cheng joined us uh, just very recently here at Microsoft Research Cambridge. So she will not be talking about work she did here, but work she did before. Uh, and the title is Active Mini Batch Sampling Using Repulsive Point Processes. Thank you for the introduction. <laughs> okay, so I'll talk about my uh, work about uh, active mini batch sampling. Okay, now this work. We are like cats, right? <laughs> uh, so nowadays, we all deal with big data and a lot of cats on the internet, so we need SGD, right? And when we use SGD, and one thing uh, why it converges a little bit slower than the batch method is because you know, uh, it's a gradient, uh, like a noisy gradient. And if we can do variance reduction on the gradient of SGD, we can convert faster and we can use bigger uh, learning rates. Uh, so this is one thing. This is one point uh, my paper will be contributing about. Secondly, the data is very screwed. For example, on YouTube, there is much more cat's image and baby image and less than like ants image and all these rare reindeers and all something like that. If we put such data set uh, in the computer to learn it, <laughs> we'll probably just uh, learn a cat, right? And that's a no problem. Uh, so data embellishment is one thing. And another tricky thing is the last one, it's a dog or a muffin. So sometimes you really want the model to focus on, like how do we differ dog from muffin, right? So uh, in general, maybe sometime we want to introduce active bias. So we can do active mini batch sampling to solve both problems at one time. <laughs> so in general, when we do SGD, this is standard way. Let's say the mini batch is B, and we sample a mini batch. We update the parameter based on the estimated gradient with certain learning rate. So my proposal is very simple. Instead of random sampling the data points to form a mini batch, we can do data, uh, like a do point process to sample the data. So point process in general just uh, models uh, how the data points are sampled from a whole data set. So use different point process, we can sample data points with all different properties. Here is a toy example, the blue dots in the background, I assume that's all the data points are available. The first one shows if we just uh, sample uniformly. And the second example shows if we want to use a repulsive point process. So you can see the data are more distributed evenly in the space. And the third one is, of course, we can modify the density, we can modify like the interactions in different areas, so we can form all different patterns or different property uh, on focusing different regions of the data space where we want to sample more or we want to sample less. So point process can be applied as a tool to sample mini batch. So we can use this as a mini batch sampling tool instead of random sampling. So we get everything under control. Okay, so in this work, I will just uh, take two examples of point process. So the first one is DPP, as Sebastian mentioned in the morning. He didn't get time to explain the deadline, so I can brief it a little bit. <laughs> so the DPP in general assess the probability to sample a subset from a set is positively proportional to its determinant. So what it tells us is a repulsive process. And here is the example. Uh, if we have just uh, two points, if we just want to sample two points, and that's the determinant. So of course, uh, I mean, like uh, uh, the determinant computed in this way. So if the diagonal uh, is very big, the off-diagonal is very small. So this will be big. Once the off-diagonal is very small, it's a kernel matrix. So it means all the points are very dissimilar. So it means they are very far away from each other in general. So that's determinant of point process that uh, relates to Sebastian's talk in the morning that we can sample points or data that are very different from each other. And then the second one I, I want to mention is the Poisson disk sampling. So determinant point process is a principal probability framework. Everyone loves to use it because we have closed form solution for everything. And another thing is Poisson disk sampling. It is a hardcore point process. Uh, what I mean by hardcore, it means if we sample a point, we have a disk that is surrounding this point and we cannot sample any point around this region anymore. So this means hardcore point process. So this point process is one of the most efficient repulsive point process. So that's the reason I used it here. For 
all point processes, there are a lot of other choices. We can use Gibbs process, which is a soft repository point process, and there is a lot of more. And here, uh, just a two example, in general, all the point process can be represented use different order of product densities. So the first order is actually just the intensity. The second order is pairwise correlation. So in this work, we only need to care about these uh, two terms. So there are many related work, of course, and actually our approach generalizes all the most related work. So I will show the related work with the toy example here. So let's assume uh, the first one is the true population. The second one is the data set we have. So that's pretty like the cats and ants problem because uh, we have much more cats than ants, but it doesn't mean like there's uh, way more cats than ants in the world, right? Uh, so this is a data set. So uh, previously, or traditionally, people use stratified sampling, which means you divide data into strata. In this case, people just use class label. And then you can sample data from different strata, uh, which means you just sample data points from different class. So you even have the data set, uh, then all the points are diversified. But first, uh, most of the time, you don't have the class label. For example, if you want to do, for example, top modeling on the documents, how can you form strata? That's the first problem. And later on, people proposed, like in 2017 actually, people proposed to use uh, pre-clustering. Uh, first, the clustering uh, is like sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. For example, in this case, it doesn't work that well. Secondly, for both approach, they don't consider the relationship between the points that falls into the same group, either strata or the cluster. So if we use point process, that's actually models of the point relationship in the point level. So we can repost them and uh, present our preference on our sampling scheme in the point level. And let's see how can we recover all these methods. So for normal SGD, and if we use DPP, if we set the similarity kernel as the diagonal matrix, we recover that. And it's the same if we use Poisson disk sampling, just to set the disk size uh, into zero, let's recover it. For stratified sampling, our, st uh, our clustering based sampling, so we just uh, make the similarity metric sampling space to be like the one half vector presentation of the uh, like membership of the cluster or strata membership and construct the similarity kernel. So we can recover that one because you can not sample data points from the same cluster because that makes the probability to be zero. And in the end, if we use a uh, point process, we can uh, like model any similarity with any different <laughs> kernels and with different densities. Uh, so let's look at the objective function we're actually optimizing. So the first one is the expected uh, loss, right? And because we assume data come from the true world or the true population, but of course we never be able to access that. And commonly in machine learning, we do this empirical loss because we just have a data set. And in our case, we actually uh, optimize the diversified risk because our data come from a point process. In this way, we are actually reweighting the data because if the, uh, there are some cluster, in some way, there are points very far away from each other, this point will be sampled much more often. So our population will be rebalanced naturally. So that's the case when we use repulsive point process. It will have the balancing information space property. But of course, when we use as a point process, we'll reweight the points in different ways. And our method, of course, <laughs> will reduce the variance. As I promised, uh, this is a toy example showing uh, why diversified mini batch sampling can reduce the variance. So let's assume these, all these points as the training data. And we just want to sample mini batch, which have three data points. And uh, the first one is sampling uh, use a uniform distribution randomly. And the second one is using a repulsive uh, point process. So that uh, here is a gradient to fit a single Gaussian for this data. So we can see if we sample the points are very different from each other, the gradient variance is way smaller than this one, right? And of course, we can now show it just with a toy example. This is not science. And we actually uh, proved it theoretically. Uh, it can uh, reduce uh, the variance. And you can check the uh, derivation in my paper. Uh, so this is the final result. So the gradient variance is expressed in this way. So the G is uh, the gradient of single point. So if two points are very close to each other, commonly the gradients are very aligned, right? So then this term, will, the yellow term, will be positive. And the second term, remember, it is the second order, the pairwise interaction divided by the density. So if it's 
uh, like a, use a traditional way to sample mini batch, that term will be zero. But if the points are repulsive, so we actually want to decorrelate the points that are close to each other, this term will be negative. So in this way, so the baseline we use the traditional SGD, the gradient will be just a second term, and with repulsive point process and the repulsive point process, including DPP or poson disk sampling or Gibbs sampling, this first term will be negative, so we can reduce the gradient uh, variance. Okay, here are some examples. And uh, so first I want to show a toy example with stopping modeling. And the task is to recover the parameter that I generate the data, so I generate a synthetic data set. This is a ground truth and topic distribution. It's a toy data, and these bars shows uh, there are different frequency. Uh, so I construct this data set uh, to show that the information is actually not balanced. And then if we do it with normal uh, stochastic variation inference, with the regular way of sampling mini batch, the result will be the second one. We can see like the last two topic where uh, there is not enough data to support it. We cannot recover it anymore. And if we use our method, we can perfectly recover it. And we also uh, show like this is experiment, you no know, fine grained classification with softmax. And the first row is a result with determinant point process. The second is with poson disk sampling. And we can see that like a, the pink line in the bottom is the baseline. And we can see that our method converge much faster than the baseline method. And at the same time, we actually have a little bit of improvement over the final result. And last one. And so we are not only satisfied with variance reduction. So we know that sometimes there are cases like that. We know there is a decision boundary <laughs> and there are a lot of data that are very, very simple. We don't need to use them all the time. Uh, so that's the reason in computer vision, there is this uh, hard, hard instant mining, right? <laughs> uh, especially for this two stage uh, object detection framework. And so sometime we want to sample more often the data points close to the decision boundary. And sometime we also want to anneal the, uh, the process during learning, for example, self-paced learning. In commonly in this group of work, they commonly start with example, which are really easy. They want the model to learn something really fast. And when uh, the model already learned something, we start to add more and more difficult examples. So we also can anneal the uh, point process to make uh, a scheduling, like the points can be easy in the beginning and become harder later on. And another thing is, so remember my derivation. I assume when the points are really close to each other, we assume the <coughs> gradients are in the same direction. That's true in general. But when the points are very close to the decision boundary, it cannot be true anymore because that's a sharp change in the gradient space, right? So what we introduce is another concept. It's actually an existing concept in uh, point processes. It's called mingling index. In general, it just says there is a point, look at the nearest the neighbors, and look at the label or marker of the point, and how many points are disagreeing with this point's label. So if there is a high mingling index, this point is more like a uh, outlier or point sit <laughs> in other, around other classes, and the mean <coughs> index is zero, means the point is really zero because this point is surrounded by other points from the same class. So in this way, if we have a high mean index, it means the point is actually close to some work of decision boundary. So we don't need to repulse this point, we only need to repulse the point that have really low mean index. So we also propose all these different variants of our method. Uh, this is another toy example showing what's the difference with this method. So this is a toy example with a wave-shaped classifier. So the random is like this, and vanilla PDA is like we just uh, use a regular version of Poisson disk sampling. So we can see the points uh, are more uniformly distributed around the whole space. And the next one is easy PDA, which means we only repulse the points which are not close to decision boundary. If the points are close to the decision boundary, we don't want to repulse them anymore, which means just uh, we set the disk uh, radius to zero when it's close to the decision boundary for points with high mean index. And the last one is we actually change the sampling frequency for points with different mean index. So we actually them actively sample more points that are close to the decision boundary. So we can see it gives different sample patterns. And the second row is we repeat the experiment in time. We just sample one mini batch and trying to learn a classifier. And we can see like in the beginning, all of them are almost straight line, you know, uh, <laughs> like from left to right, we have 
uh, more classifier actually close to the ground truth classifier. Uh, we also evaluate with uh, some a little bit more real data, which is MNIST, and the second one is speech recognition for all these different methods. So we can actually see that, uh, for example, in the MNIST, uh, for all our points actually uh, converge, uh, like a, we have the baseline method, which is just a standard SGD, and all our methods reach the same performance, like the best performance as standard SGD uh, in a shorter time, so it converge faster. But for this annealed uh, SGD, which means we are adding more hard examples with the wrong, which is kind of the purple line there, um, it can perform better because it can uh, continue learns more things in the later iteration, which has better performance. And second is the speech data, which is like to recognize uh, a word from a speech signal. And in this way, uh, the blue line is baseline, our method performed better, like change densities, like according to meaning that didn't help that much as in the MNIST example because the speech data is really noisy. So this is TSME plot. So that most of the data points actually have, have high meaning index already. So this does not help that much. But in general, use this repulsive point process can give us uh, a lot of performance improvement. Mm -hmm. So to conclude, uh, so I propose active mini batch sampling using point processes. Depends on your application need or your data property. We can adapt this uh, to any density, any repulsive uh, property, and we can reduce the variance. And we show that our method is generalization of all this existing work, for example, stratified sampling uh, and uh, regular SGD. And in the end, we actually prove theoretically uh, there is a guarantee, uh, like a, the condition to reduce the variance is this repulsiveness. As far as the point process is repulsive, we can reduce the gradient variance. Uh, I'm very new here. I just joined last week. <laughs> so this project uh, is done before I joined Microsoft. So my collaborators are in Disney Research and KTH. Yeah, the, there is a paper published in UAI last year, and this paper was only about DPP for the round. We generate our, uh, generalize our approach to any point process. The proof that uh, any repulsive point process can be used is uh, in the NIPS workshop paper. Uh, I'm very new here, and uh, in my past, I did a lot of research in all kinds of things. Uh, I'm interested in variational inference, and some audience here gave me a lot of feedback uh, during uh, the paper writing process. Like, I wrote a very long review paper about variational inference uh, in the end of last year. And uh, if you have feedback, please let me know. <laughs> uh, I also did a lot of work with other applications, for example, healthcare or computer vision. Uh, I'm very new to Microsoft, so I'm looking to collaborate with people both inside Microsoft and outside Microsoft. So if you share any similar research interest, just uh, let me know and talk with me afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for staying on time. So we have time for questions, actually. Mm -hmm. Images. It's extremely hard to mention. I think uh, all the data are very far away from each other. For my experiment, I actually sample it in the feature space because you want, uh, you know, a certain meaningful <laughs> representation in the first place that can mirror similarity, right? Yeah. Uh, so, it's already a mirror so it's already uh, depends on the application. So I mean, it's, it, I didn't do that, but for the flower data set, I did that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to sample your mini passages on you changing your the risk you're optimizing if you do not reweight that's the first question the second is probably related like how do you come up with useful kernels so i didn't get like fully for the speech recognition let's say it's sequences right you need some way to measure i guess how, how similar samples are which might be sequences of different lengths and stuff right 
Okay, so for the first question, uh, uh, of course, like uh, uh, this is actually biased when you sample with point precise, you rate it. But of course, like for DPP, you know the marginal probability of each point being sampled. It have analytic form of solution, and you can compute it extremely fast. Uh, so if you want to use the unbiased version, just to reweight it. So the bi here is the marginal probability of a point being sampled. <laughs> yeah. And for the second question, I think it's related to his question. So uh, I mean, like uh, for most of the experiment, as far as it's not it's not like a super toy experiment. Uh, I mapped the feature, uh, yeah, I mapped the data into some feature space. Great, let's thank Cheng again for a wonderful presentation.